Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Youth Week of Prayer. Um, we'll just start with a hymn, um, a short service, a uh, song service. So I'd like us to pray before we begin. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day. We thank you so much for the gift of life, and we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather here, particularly for the Youth Week of Prayer. Even as we're about to start our praise session, I pray that you may be with us now and forevermore. This is my humble prayer in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so we'll start with hymn 358. 358, Far and Near. Thanksgiving will sing Let All Things Now Living 560. Let All Things Now Living.
Elohim 425. 425.
Praise God. Praise the Lord again. Good evening. Have we had a good day today? All right. We welcome all of you into this place. And we also welcome all of us that's joining us online for another day where we want to be blessed just as we have been blessed over the last two days from the words that have been spoken from above through uh, our pastor. Uh, how many are coming here physically for the first time? All right, we welcome all of you. Feel at home and uh, stay blessed. We also want to welcome those who are joining us online for the first time that uh, uh, stay tuned and God is going to speak to you today. Uh, just to remind us that when we are coming here, we should try and uh, not come by ourselves. We invite a friend. Amen? Yeah. Try tomorrow to see if you can invite a friend. For those who may not be aware, we are in our day three of our week, youth week of prayer. And uh, God has been speaking to us through his servant, Pastor Colin Mapper. And uh, we are going, this program will run through up to, uh, uh, on Friday and have a climax on Sabbath. So we continue to invite all of us every evening. At this time, I want to um, just uh, welcome those who are going to minister with us here. We have our sister Orpa, who is going to lead us in the scripture reading and in the songs, she's here. Maybe she could wave. Thank you. We also have our sister Eunice, who is also going to lead us in uh, the music. Are you there? Thank you. Uh, our brother Otala Kevin will lead us in the prayer session shortly. Before that, I'd like to invite our chorister to come and lead us in the theme song for this um, evening, and that is Onward Christian Soldiers, song number 612. We can rise for the theme song. Okay. 
Uh, in that spirit, we want to go before the Lord uh, in prayers. I uh, want to speak to the Lord. So I'll request us to pair into threes, group of threes. I'll give you 10 minutes uh, to speak to the Lord. Pray to each other in that group. Then I'll culminate it uh, with the final prayer. So kindly group into threes, 10 minutes, so that we keep on time.
Let's rise and wind up. Let's pray. Everlasting Father in heaven, we are so grateful, Lord, that uh, once again you have allowed us, Lord, to come and speak to you and to listen uh, from your man servant, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the day that has been. Thank you, Lord, for allowing your children to come, Lord. We have submitted our prayers, Lord, before you. We pray, Lord, that may you answer them, Lord, according to your will. And Lord, even as uh, our speaker, our pastor comes, Lord, to speak to us, may your word, Lord, find a place in our hearts. For in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God is good and all the time. I would like to call two groups for a special item. One of them is uh, the orchestra. Are they in? Okay. Uh, if they are not in, then the young adults can uh, come forward for a special item. Thank you.
Amen to the good music. I would like to welcome uh, the saxophonist to also come and give a special item. Can you hear me? Praise God. So, um, you heard of an orchestra. Um, we were supposed to come with uh, some friends, but then they were not available, so I'm representing them. My name is Alfred. I'm going to sing or play a song by the name My Tribute, or commonly known as To God Be The Glory.
read our scripture reading from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 24, from verse 1 to 7. I will give you six seconds to open your Bibles. Are we all there? No. <laughs> First Samuel chapter 24, from verse 1 to 7. If we are there, please say amen. Thank you. And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi, then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep courts by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went, went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. Verse 4, And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privately. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him, because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words, and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. Amen. Pastor Mapa will come and expand more on the scripture reading. Thank you. I greet the church in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. For the sake of that one who kept looking at me and ignoring me, I'm going to greet you again. You. I mean, you, 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 you saw me, you heard me, but you ignored me. So I'm giving you an opportunity to respond. It's not good to ignore others in church. I'm greeting you. You ignore me. If you ignore people in church, I wonder if you'll make it to heaven. Just joking. Just joking. Good evening, church. How are you doing? Mungu ni mwema. Siku zote. We praise God for his blessings that keep coming every day. And we thank God for the beautiful voices and the instrument. We praise God for that. The text has been read. So I will give you the sermon title. We pray and then we look at it together. So the sermon title for tonight is The Deception of Open Doors. The Deception of Open Doors. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for yet another opportunity to listen to you as you speak to us through your word. It is my prayer this evening that uh, someone may come out of this church having been lifted up in spirit and having been helped by this word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. The deception of open doors. Open doors, that's... Um, an English phrase that simply means opportunities, okay? Opportunities. And there are opportunities that come in your life when you're okay. Everything is fine. For example, you have a good job, and then you are offered another job. That decision really doesn't give you much of a stressful time to decide, to say, should I go or should I not? Because you are comfortable, you are okay. Your situation is fine. 
but there are certain open doors. And these open doors have the potential to change your life, to give your life a paradigm shift. They have the opportunity to move you from sadness to gladness. These kind of doors, they can change your life and move you from a place of discomfort to a place where you are filled with comfort. And it is in this context that I want us to look at David's life for a moment. These open doors, they have the potential to make your life better, to take you away from a tough time and give you a good time, to take you away from a tight spot, from standing between a hard place and a rock to the comfort that life can give. It is in this context that we want to look at the life of David for a moment. But looking at the life of David, I came to realize that not all open doors are by divine providence. It's not every time when you see an opportunity that you can safely say, God has given me this, number one. And number two, not all open doors are for you to enter. Some come giving you an opportunity to practice principle. Some come giving you an opportunity to practice obedience. And some come giving you an opportunity to pause and reflect and show your loyalty to God. So we read in 1 Samuel chapter 24 that it came to pass when Saul had returned from following the Philistines. He was told, saying, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild gods. What do we learn from here? Saul is hot and hard on the heels of David. He is after the life of David, and he is not playing. He wants the head of David on the plate, and he is gone out to make sure that the enemy of his progress dies. Because the growth and the coming of David threatened the dynasty of Saul. He is looking forward to his son Jonathan taking over the throne from him when he is dead or when he is retired. And so we see that in chapter 23, when chapter 23 ends, if Saul had not been disturbed by a message that came to say, the Philistines are almost on our borders. You need to stop what you are doing. Stop pursuing David and come and deal with these enemies. Were it not for that, this was going to be the end of David. Read with me. First Samuel chapter 23. But there came a messenger. Let's go uh, to verse number 26. And Saul went on this side of the mountain. And David and his men on that side of the mountain. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul. Listen to this part. For Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them. So they were besieged. They had nowhere else to run to. But because of the message of the Philistines coming to attack Israel, Saul had to stop this chase and he went back. And this is the Saul who is coming after David. But to my amazement, when David gets an open door to set his life free, he does not take it. He doesn't. He lets the opportunity slide. By the time we get to 1 Samuel chapter 24, Saul has attempted to terminate David five times. You need to follow me closely now, or I enjoy this by myself. Five times, Saul has attempted to kill David, and he knows that. But when he gets an opportunity to bring misery to an end in his life, he does not take the opportunity. David amazed me when I was studying this chapter. What kind of a man is this? Who, when he has seen an open door, that is opening a whole world of freedom before him, he does not take it. He doesn't. You need to understand that Saul 
was so focused on killing David that he had a disregard for his own children. <laughs> you know what he said? Michelle, you are my daughter. But this is what we're going to do. You are going to marry David so that you can be a trap to David. Saul has no plan of making David his in-law. His plan is to kill David, but he uses his own daughter as bait. Oh my God. And what do you find again? When Saul discovered that Jonathan was busy telling David information to tell him, my father has planned to kill you, so you need to go this way. He is coming, go that way. When he discovered that he almost killed the heir to the throne, he did not mind about his children so long David has died. But when David gets an opportunity to put all this to an end, what does he do? He allows the opportunity to slide. He looks at the open door and he tells himself, this one, it will close while I'm standing here. I am not going through. You need to understand that uh, he lived a life of being a fugitive running to the Moabites, coming back, escaping to the Philistines, coming back. When I studied, when he went to the Philistines, he got to this lord of the Philistines called Akish. And when he looked at his face, trying to find a place to hide, he was so afraid that he acted as a madman. And his acting convinced Akish to say, this person is mad. Why are you bringing a mad person to me? But when he finds an opportunity to put all this to an end, he lets the opportunity slide. He allows the open door to close. Now you need to understand that it took 15 years from the day, about 15 years, from the day David was anointed up to the time he ascended the throne. 15 years. He could have said, but I'm anointed. He is also anointed. So the anointed can hunt each other down and kill each other. But when he saw the opportunity to kill Saul, he said, I will not touch the anointed of God. And he allowed the opportunity to slide. I'm trying to intensify this so that you understand what kind of a decision David made and how serious it was. When you read verse number two, you are told that Saul took 3,000 chosen soldiers. There's a difference between 3,000 soldiers and 3,000 chosen soldiers. Very different. So he would line his soldiers up and say, you are not going. You are going. You go home. You, I'm going with you. 3,000 military contingents, infantry, 3,000, a legion of soldiers. And he is going after one man who has only 600 men. So by this time, they are outnumbered five to one. Even if they try to engage in battle, they have no chance. They stand no chance because they are totally outnumbered. But when he gets an opportunity to set himself free, he doesn't take it. David amazed me. Now, in a scene that, that is worthy, that is deserving to make it in the Hall of Fame for these action thrillers, the Bible says 3,001 men move towards the cave at Engedi, and they stop at the mouth of the cave. And 601 men are inside the cave, standing and hiding on the sides of the cave. For a moment there, tell me what they were thinking. For a moment they just tell me. But when that kind of a moment comes and David can end the life of Saul, he doesn't take the opportunity. This man is amazing. And so... The wonder of wonders, a miracle of all time. Instead of 3,000 men getting into the cave, only one gets in. I can picture the soldiers of David breathing a heavy sigh of relief. We thought they were all coming in. Nature has called. So Saul gets into the cave. And as he is responding to nature, his servants, David's servants, say something to him. Listen to what they said. 
And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto you, Behold, I will deliver. When you see that term, I will deliver. And God is saying that it's used mainly in military victories. When you go for war, and God tells you, read your historical books. When Israel would go for war, and the prophet would come before the, the soldiers, and they would say, God has said, I will deliver. They would go to war in confidence, knowing that God is done fighting our enemies already before we lift our spears. That's what it means. And so these, these servants of David are saying, listen, God has delivered your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as you please. And all this while everything is going well. And the Bible says, then David arose. Pause. If you were one of David's soldiers, seeing David rise, picking up his sword, Charging stealthily, softly, treading towards Saul. What would you think? Saul is gone. Saul is finished. But the narrative takes an odd twist. It's an odd twist. Instead of cutting off the head of Saul, he cuts off a piece of a garment. Ah. If you were David soldiers, what would you say? What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? You know that the moment a general dies, every other soldier on the other side of the army, they bow before the one who has killed their general. It's automatic. The 3,000 soldiers out there will not attempt to fight against you. In any case, they are not happy about how Saul is leading. They are unhappy about what he is doing. He is wasting national resources, chasing after one man with a few 600 men. Instead of investing in the growth of Israel, we don't like this man. If Saul was to die here, David was going to go straight to the throne of David and sit there. One stroke of his sword, I said one, just one, pin Saul to the wall of the cave and Saul is gone and he has taken over. But even with that door opening right before him, he paused to consider principle. What does God say? You shall not kill. <laughs> Let me enjoy myself. What was the need for these men? What was the need for these men? Number one, they would go home. You know what that means? Do you know what that means? Staying in, 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 in caves and, and hiding in, in rocks and sleeping on trees and running away from so you have a chance to go home and your commander wastes it. They had the opportunity not to fight. Because if they were going to engage in battle with the soldiers of Saul, some were going to lose their lives. And if one soldier dies in war, we have created a widow back home. One soldier dies in war, we have created orphans back home. So these gentlemen had a chance to go back home for a great reunion with their wives and children. But alas, David doesn't take the opportunity. He cuts off a garment instead. And he steps away from the man who is hunting for his head. So I looked at uh, the life of David and said, these men were actually aiming for positions of honor. You know, when you are just 600, the entire nation of Israel, he would make sure he fits you somewhere. And you are respected and honored in Israel, but they forfeited this chance when they expected it the most. Why? David paused to consider principle. So David understood that, yes, this is an open door, but it's deceptive. Why is it deceptive? It's making me go in after I have bent principle. Ah. It's making me go in after I have broken the law of God. If there is an open door before me, that's David speaking. I will not. Ellen White says, when his people said, kill him, he almost fell for it. But then he paused and told himself, he who kills by the sword will also die with the sword. 
And he remembered that in as much as my men are taking this as an act of war, I cannot touch the anointed of God. And so he let so go free. And the lesson that I get from the life of David, it is the kind of spirit I pray for myself and the kind of spirit I pray for you. You want to move from a place of discomfort to a place of comfort. But if that open door requires that you bend principle, don't do it. Ah... It's deceptive. Don't do it. Don't take that opportunity. And so David understood that not all open doors are by divine providence. And not all open doors are meant for me to enter. There are moments in life when I have to stick to my discomfort until God says it's Uhuru now. Moments in life when he says not yet Uhuru, it's not yet Uhuru. So I stick in my sadness, waiting for God to turn my mourning into joy. I would rather not. God is looking for a set of people in Lovington who say we will radically obey God, even in moments of uncertainty and danger. We would rather stick with God. And so someone is here. You are here. Entrance through the door was through the blood of someone. And David told himself, I will not shed blood in order to get to my comfort. And God is looking for such a people in church who say, I will not bend principle so that I can own a car. I will not do that. The car has to be paid with its proper gross vehicle mass. People have this system of uh, playing around with the NVMs and the GVMs so that they pay less. <laughs> Right at Mombasa here. People play around with figures so that they can also roll donuts when they are coming to church. But God is looking for a people who say, if that open door requires that I break any of the commandments of God, then I'm not doing it. I will matatu my way to church until God says, now you drive. I will Uber my way. And so you are here. You are taking care of your parents. They are down there in Kisi. And they are looking up to you. Your siblings are looking up to you. They want to be fed by you. They want to be clothed by you. They want to be sent to school by you. Every month end. You, you don't think. And you don't even think of yourself. Whatever it is you get at the end of whatever peace job you do. You just empathize it all the way. You don't think. Why? Because your family is hanging on your shoulders. But then an open door comes right before you. And they tell you, when they are looking at your curriculum vitae, they say, this is the person we were looking for. Where have you been all along? These are the qualifications we want for this job. And this is the number of shillings you'll be getting plus these allowances. You have a housing allowance. You have a car allowance. You have an education allowance. If you have any dependents, we will send them to school for you. Only come to work on Saturday for two hours. Two hours and you go to church. Aha. Open door, but it's deceptive. And God is looking for soldiers of the cross who will say, the Sabbath is the day of the Lord, not me, not this time, not ever. God is looking for such people who will remember the Lord and what he has said. If the will of God is clear, unmistakably clear in your mind, what you must do, you are safe to follow it and not consider consequences. Are we together, church? Yes. You are not well. It's been a while. You're not all right. And, and, and there is a false prophet somewhere by your corner there. And people who are going there are coming back leaping like cows. And you're seeing it. <laughs> you know what the devil does? If you are okay, you will never see a poster written traditional healer here or false prophet here. But when you are in a situation that needs those kinds of people, you see it. He has a way of opening your eyes and saying, hey, you are in problem. Look, that, there is your solution over there. You see it. 
But God is looking for a child of his who will say, I would rather stick with my swollen foot, oh my God, than bend principle and have other gods. That's what God is looking for. And that's what David is teaching. He had the opportunity to set himself free, but he did not because principle told him, this door is not yours. Why are these doors deceptive? They have a way of giving you this feel-good feeling. That, that, that they have a way of throwing you into the future. Before you even get there, you're driving, you own a car, you're married, whatever it is. And so they deceive you by giving you the comfort you are not supposed to receive, but you are yet to receive it. So they deceive you by playing around with your senses, playing around with your future, the very future which God says when the time is right, I, the Lord, will make things right. They are deceptive. You are here. It's been a while. And you don't want to be lonely anymore. <laughs> I have a brother. His name is Craig. In his days when he was single, he made a TikTok video. The blanket is over his body a bit and he, the eyes are out. He takes out his phone and he says, Good night to me. I miss me. I love me. And you are tired of that. You want to be sent to sleep by an I love you kind of enemy. But it's just not happening. And you want to move from that place of discomfort to a place of comfort. You want someone to wake you up and say, I was just thinking about you. But it's not happening. And so an open door comes. A guy with a beautiful nose. Good job. Steady, self-sustained. He's owning an apartment. He actually has flats that he's renting out. He's ready for you any time of the day, but just not when you want to come to church. He's not. Aha. Uh -huh. And so you see it as an open door. Huh? You see yourself being driven to church by your better half. And, and, and the moment you see that guy, you, you see yourself walking down the red carpet and everything is okay. But let me tell you something, my sister. It's a deceptive open door. It's not meant for you. If that man does not worship the same God you worship and your faiths are different, you are treading on sinking sand. It's not long before we miss you on earth. Uh -huh. Go and read Joshua chapter 23. Joshua will tell you that these nations that have been left by God, because you, children of Israel, I had told you not to marry these people who don't believe in the same God that you believe in. Whatever reasons you have, he goes to church, he goes to, but if he doesn't use these doors, then you are in, pro, in a trap, in lot of trouble. Are we together, church? Yeah, so Joshua says, these people are going to be like thorns on your sides. So you won't be having a boyfriend. You have a thorny boyfriend. You know when you act stubborn, talk to my brothers and my sisters who are here, you act stubborn and you go against a clear, thus says the Lord, do not be unequally yoked. You are digging your own spiritual grave. Back home we have a, a, a story, an adage, if I may call it, of mice. You, you, you guys, you have mice here? Mouse, one. Mice, many. Yeah. So a story is told that never happened that one mouse was told by its ancestors to say, humanity is not good. Human beings are wrong. Don't ever come close to humanity. They will kill you. And then the mouse said, but my ancestors, why, why do my ancestors say humanity is wrong? I can see peanut butter over there. And it's human beings who make peanut butter. That's peanut butter. And it sniffed a little. It sniffed. It got close. It sniffed. And it said, no, my ancestors are wrong. Very wrong. There is nothing wrong with humanity. These are good people. And it got close to the peanut butter. But it did not notice that the peanut butter was drawing it to a mouse trap. We all know that mice don't have hands. They reach out with their mouth. 
And so it stretched its mouth. And when it just touched the butter for little micro milliseconds, nano, if you may call it, the, 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 this, this, this set of uh, steel that is made into like teeth waiting this side. And then there's this other one that comes in no time. And in no time, the neck of the mouse was clipped between the teeth and this wire. And that's when it said, no, my ancestors were right, but it was too late. It was dying. That's exactly what will happen to you <laughs> when you decide to go against a clear that says the Lord. It's a trap. It's a deceptive open door. Rather you wait on God. When the time is right, he makes things right. Trust your God. You know, how can God bring you into this world knowing you would want these things and then he deprives you of those things? When an open door comes before you, you need to pause. Before you enter, consider principle. Consider the laws of God. Are you not breaking any of the principles in the Bible? Are you not breaking any of the laws of God? If not, then proceed with caution. But if so, you need to tell yourself the door is not mine. I'm talking about your business that is taking a noise diving direction right now. Things are not well. But bribing your way back to prosperity is a deceptive open door. It's deceptive. You don't take it. It's not yours. It may promise comfort and life, but it's not meant for you. I'm talking about a sister who is here deprived of love by her husband. He no longer looks at her. He no longer comments her hair. He no longer comments her dressing. Nothing. She goes to the salon. She stays in those big thing, hot stuff. For hours, he, she comes back. The husband sees a bowed head. He says nothing. But the moment you set your foot in your office at work, Jack is ready to comment. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Where did you get this dress from? Jack is ready. He, she, he showers you with comments until you tell him, I'm suffocating. It's enough. And your husband since stopped checking if you have had lunch. Jack doesn't do that. If he goes out, he brings you something to chew. Oh, nice Jack. And before you know it, Jack is giving you enough time. And before you know it, you are going out of the house where your husband is to receive calls from Jack. And before you know it, you are standing before a mirror, checking, and now you're dressing for Jack. And before you know it, you are in the saloon getting your hair done. For It's a deceptive open door. It could be that you are a young lady and you are here all alone. The church does not see you. The rich in the church do not help you. Those who are well up do not see you, but you're trying to make ends meet. You don't have rent or money. Someone's husband is a deceptive open door. Don't go there. Don't go there. But what you need to know about these deceptive open doors is that they always have a way of coming back. They keep coming back. They keep knocking, testing your strength. Will you obey your God? What? Are you going to revere principle? Are you going to have a reverence for your God? Are you going to do what he always say? Jump one chapter and go to the 26th. We see the same people. This time around, Saul is fast asleep. First Samuel chapter 26, verse 1 to 12. Saul is fast asleep. And this is what they would do. Saul would sleep in the center. And Abna and the other guys, the three, then the 30 soldiers of Saul, and then the rest of the other soldiers and whatever they used to move. So for you to get to Saul, you have to jump a lot of sleeping bodies. And when you are in the center, you cannot afford to make any noise. Let those who are at the end wake up and they say, ah, you are here, welcome. But the Bible in verse 12 says there was a deep sleep that was sent on Saul and his entire 3,000, a deep sleep from God. Ah. The deep sleep came from heaven. And so David is with uh, this man, the Hittite. His name is gone and he is with Abishai. Abishai is known to be a steward of time. He does not waste time. He seeks seize an opportunity to kill his slaughters. He doesn't miss. That's Abishai for you. 
And so Abishai says, no, I'll go with you. Let's go together. And so they tiptoe. Into the right into the center of the camp of Saul and his soldiers, and that's where Saul is sleeping fast asleep, a sleep, deep sleep sent from heaven. And they get there, and Abishai says, You you have a problem, you last time, you. So I'm not gonna ask you to do anything. Let me <laughs> let me let me deal. They are in the center of the camp. But Abishai wants to slaughter. David's men were brave. The bravery was out of this world. What if he says, mm, and people wake up? But he said, if I strike this man, he will not make a sound. I will make sure that he dies in his sleep. Give me an opportunity. And David says, what I told you in chapter 24, I'll tell you again now. This is a deceptive open door. Take the spear, take the cruise of water, and let's be out of here. I'm telling you this because deceptive open doors keep coming. They keep coming. And so for you to keep overcoming, you need to stay on your knees. Stay in touch with Christ. He is the antidote for sin. The only injection that can chase the devil away. Without him, we are doomed. Are we together, church? Open doors have a way of coming back. And I wish the church to know that when the time is right, God makes things okay. Don't, you know, the moment you test these deceptive open doors, the moment you test the money that comes out of a bribe, I tell you, <laughs> it will be very difficult for you to let go. Some of these habits, they are like strings that are rolled over and over. If you roll one string and you tie me with one string, I can easily break it. But if you keep rolling it, it will become difficult to break it. If that habit continues, you keep going out with married men. You keep going out with young men and young men who don't know the God you worship. You keep getting jobs using your back. You get used to that. You are in for a trouble. So when the deceptive open door comes again, I want to say Daniel was given his open door. You don't pray, you leave. You pray, you die. And Daniel says, okay, this open door that you are giving me is a door to life. You need to understand that. The open door that Daniel was given was a door to life. The same applies with the three Hebrew boys. They were given an open door to life, but they were supposed to sacrifice just one of the commandments of God. They were supposed to bow before the idol in the plains of Dura. And they said, no. Open doors are not open doors if we break the law. Don't give us another opportunity, Nebuchadnezzar. Do what you have to do. And so they are taken up, thrown into the fiery furnace. But what I know about God, he vindicates those who stand for him. What was burnt on them were the ropes of Babylon. Everything Babylonish. But they came out walking. You see, these things, when you take these deceptive open doors and you enter, you are depriving God a chance to show you miracles. Oh my God. You are depriving yourself an experience to see God at work. When you bribe to get a tender, you have deprived yourself to see God in action. Don't do it. Let God do it for you. Then you can come and say, there are things that we say, I thank God for this, and God says, What? I don't know about that one. But you need to know that these three Hebrew boys, you need to know that Daniel did not pause to consider principle. And Ellen White says, true Christian principle does not stop to weigh consequences. It doesn't. True Christian principle, when you look at it, you're going to suffer loss tomorrow. You're going to do this tomorrow. You may die tomorrow. But when you are supposed to obey God, you obey him and you leave the consequences with God. It's none of your business. It's none of your business. Are we together, church? And you read Revelation chapter 13. John will tell you that there is a time when buying and selling will not be allowed, save if you have a mark 
of the beast. Open door. You want to buy, you want to sell, receive the mark. Open door. But God wants to prepare a church. If God allows us to get there in our lifetime, God wants to prepare a church when the mark is declared. A church that will stand and say, I would rather die than sin. I would rather hunger than defraud. It's better to suffer with the children of God. Am I preaching a gospel of poverty? No, I'm preaching a gospel of faithfulness before God. So that open door, it's deceptive. Why? Because when you go to Revelation chapter 14, God also has his own story there. This side, if you don't accept the mark, you die. In chapter 14, God has his own story. You accept the mark, you die. Death is on both ends. But let me help you, help you choose. Huh? Chapter 14, verse 13 then says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. That verse is not supposed to be read when I die of corona. No. You are arm twisting it. That text is a text for martyrs. People who die for God, having refused to accept decrees of this world. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. In the Lord. Their works follow them. Talking to someone right now who either accepted an open door that was deceptive and you're in it, or you are planning to enter. We want to pray for you. We are supposed to be showing up in the cities, but the reason why we are not showing up in the cities effectively. It is because there are people who have accepted deceptive open doors. And what they have done is counterproductive to mission. There's a pre-Adventist young lady out there who is a side chick to an Adventist married man. You didn't hear me. Why? Because the man found it sorrowful to live with this wife. So he found a side dish. But do you know that we also want that side dish to get baptized? How will she get baptized with what you're doing? You. Out there, there is a young man who is being used as a benton by someone in church. Counterproductive to mission. Out there, there is a pre-Adventist boss who has Adventist workers, but they go to church to work on Saturday, and when we preach to him about the Sabbath, he says, wait, then why do those who claim to be Adventists come to work? They accepted deceptive open doors. When we accept these doors, we are defeating the reason why we exist as a church. You see, you may preach all you want, but if your lifestyle speaks against what you say, then we're not doing anything. We're moving in circles. We're like a long, long, young lady who wants to lose weight. So she wakes up in the morning. She does aerobics. She goes jogging five minutes. She goes to the gym. When she comes back, it's chocolate and candy the whole day. Moving in circles. Moving in circles. But I want to pray with you. And this call is a bit direct. So this is how we're going to do it. If you are facing an open door. But you know it's deceptive and you need the strength not to enter. Let's meet in the vestry. Or maybe you already are inside a room that's comfortable, but you know you are there bending principle week in, week out. You need strength. You can't do it on your own. You can't. This man called the devil is so very much experienced he has studied humanity for the past 6,000 plus years. He knows which buttons to press, but we praise God for Christ, whose blood has the power to overcome sin. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to rise and pray. And if you're one of the people who needs prayers, we'll be at the back there with the elders, and we pray together. Is that okay? Let's rise and pray. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war.
cross of Jesus going on before. Christ the royal master leads against the foe. Forward into battle, see his banners go. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided. Oh, one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Crowns and thrones have perished, kingdoms rose and wane. But the church of Jesus constant will remain. Gates of hell can never against the church prevail. We have God's own promise. That can never fail. Onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. I will ask Elder Absalom to come so that we can pray over this box as, as we do the last prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne. Again today, we wrote our burdens and our cares on paper, but we know that you saw what we wrote there. Because praying is not giving you information, but praying is looking for your presence in our hearts so that we may look at problems from your perspective how we pray that we always remember how big you are. Teach us to remind our problems how big our God is. And normally challenges in anticipation, they seem so painful and big. But we pray that as we continue to lift these before you, that you may create testimonies for your people. That we, as we testify of your goodness to others, as we go out of these gates and we tell people that there is a God who answers prayers, we will be telling them what we have experienced. And so we pray that you bless everyone who walked up front and put a paper in there. Some didn't walk, but you know what burdens they are carrying. Come through for all of us. Meet us at our points of need because we know you are Able for all this, we have prayed. Amen. 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 We have come to the end of our session today. And uh, Pastor, we are so grateful for the wonderful message. I didn't know that these jobs that we take sometimes are deceptive open doors, but at least uh, God spoke through you. And uh, I believe the sermon will inform our choices and our decisions henceforth. I would like to thank you so much for creating time to attend our session uh, today. We will be doing this again tomorrow from 5.30 in the evening, and uh, you're all invited. Please remember to tag a friend when you're coming uh, from work or a neighbor when you're coming from home. 
or even your seatmate in the bus, you can tell them we are having something nice here and that they can drop in. I would like us to all stand with uh, the word of grace so that we can depart. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.